Hi, my name is Matthew and I am an ancient history student studying for a PhD at Wadham College at the University of Oxford. Uh, my main area of research is into ancient Greek slavery and that's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about in this video. So the main objectives of this session are first of all just to give you a, a sense of the importance of slavery to the study of ancient Greece uh, and the prevalence of slavery in the ancient world. Um, second of all, to get you thinking a little bit about why we study ancient slavery, about why it's important. And thirdly, to get you thinking about how we study ancient slavery. So the types of sources that we can use to get at the experience of slavery uh, and the reality of the ancient world. So the first key question is, what is slavery? Um, you might already have an idea of this yourself, uh, but it's actually slightly more difficult to define slavery than it might initially seem. And particularly if we're looking for ways in which slavery can be compared across different societies. Uh, the simplest way that it can be defined is as a legal or property relationship. Um, so one human being is essentially owned by another. Um, this is often referred to as chattel slavery um, and is identified as the common form in the ancient world. And although this is useful as an identifier um, and it's often the way in which um, the enslavers perceive this relationship, um, it's not particularly informative about the experience of slavery. Um, and that's why there are other ways of thinking about slavery which focus on it as a, as a social relationship. Um, it's often emphasised that slaves um, are subject to routine acts of violence and dishonour um, and are deprived of all family relationships. Um, but whatever our definition, the experience of each individual enslaved person um, is partially dependent on a huge variety of factors, uh, such as their age, their gender, their occupation, um, as well as their individual relationships. Um, but it is crucial, I think, to remember that these were people who were completely without legal rights, um, which means that in, in practice, they could be subject to almost any treatment at the hands of their enslavers. Um, in the ancient world, it's extremely difficult to judge the scale of slavery, um, and that's because we don't have any reliable ancient numbers. Um, but what we do see is that slavery appears in all corners of ancient society, and so we can be fairly certain that it was a strategy employed very widely in a variety of contexts. Um, in terms of where slaves uh, came from in the ancient world, um, probably the most common form is war um, or piracy, so, so capture. Um, individuals could then be sold. Um, some individuals fell into slavery through debt bondage, uh, while others were born into slavery. Um, there seems to have been an ideal in the Greek world that Greeks should not enslave other Greeks, i.e. that um, slaves should be foreigners. Uh, but when we start to look at the reality of this, this ideal didn't always happen. Um, in terms of uh, what slave we find enslaved persons doing in the ancient world. Again, there is a huge variety. Uh, we have domestic servants, so serving as tutors or nursemaids for the children of, of their enslavers. Uh, we have agricultural workers. We have miners, and this is something that I'll um, talk about a little more later. Um, we have craft workers um, of varying degrees of skill. We have bankers, administrators, and even um, in classical Athens, which I'm about to, to uh, introduce you to, um, a police force made up of enslaved persons. Before I go on to why it's important to study ancient slavery, um, I just want to give you a bit of background on classical Athens, because that's the example that I'm going to be using um, through most of this video. Um, so classical Athens was the wealthiest and most powerful Greek state in what's known as the classical period, which is broadly speaking the 5th and 4th centuries BCE. Um, Athens has always attracted a lot of interest, both from scholars and uh, the wider public, and this is mainly the result of its, um, of its out artistic and literary output. So the architecture and sculptures of classical Athens are, are extremely famous, um, as are its dramas, uh, tragedies and comedies. Um, its philosophy, you might have heard of uh, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. Uh, its history writing, you might have heard of Thucydides and Xenophon. Um, but Athens is also extremely famous for its political structure. Uh, Athens is credited with the invention of democracy. Um, and the invention of democracy in particular has often made Athens a, a kind of paradigm, an example of inclusion and representative government. 
Um, but more recently, scholars have been much more willing to identify the exclusionary elements of Athenian democracy. Uh, those with a stake in its government were a relatively small group of citizen males, uh, representing only a fraction of the city's population. Um, women were excluded completely, um, as were those without two citizen parents. Um, and at the extreme end of this exclusion were slaves. Um, and we know that a huge number of slaves were employed in classical Athens, um, most notably in the silver mines, um, from which Athens derived most of its wealth. So in a sense, um, the prosperity of this city was entirely based upon slave labor. I now move on to why it's important that we study ancient slavery. Um, and, and in a sense, I've already partially answered this. Um, the role of the historian, we might argue, is to understand and explain as fully as possible the society which they're studying. And if this is the case, I think Athens offers a very good example of why we must take the whole picture into account. Um, if we don't acknowledge the prevalence of slavery and indeed other mass inequalities, um, we get this wrongful impression that Athens was a society based on inclusion and on participation. Um, but this is extremely misleading uh, and leaves us with a completely distorted impression of historical reality. Um, so whether you think the aim of studying history is, is to provide uh, examples, uh, something to learn from, whether negative or positive, um, or if it's simply to acquire accurate knowledge for its own sake, I think we must try and be as accurate as possible with the models that we create and with the stories that we tell. And slavery is an essential part of the story of the ancient world. Uh, the study of ancient slavery is also useful in the broader context of the study of slavery as a phenomenon. Um, so the effects of slavery are still with us in the modern world. And in fact, millions of people are still enslaved today. Um, so the study of slavery in general is highly relevant and studying the dynamics of slavery across different societies, across time and space, um, in different cultural contexts, is useful for understanding how and why slavery persists. My so, even if we accept that studying ancient slavery is important and relevant, we then turn to the tricky question of how do we study it? Um, the traditional sources used by ancient historians um, are ancient literature, so the historical, philosophical or political writings of contemporary authors. Um, and the problem with these sources for the topic of slavery is that they're all written by quite a small group of elite men. That's so members of the richest and, and privileged strata of society. Their interests, therefore, often don't coincide with our own as social historians. Um, and when slavery is mentioned, it's usually done casually uh, and it's always from the point of view of enslavers. And this doesn't mean that they're useless um, and their casual remarks often provide us with a really interesting insight. Um, but it does mean that we get this very one-sided partial impression. Um, and that's why we need to supplement these sources um, using also material culture. One type of source that's extremely important to the ancient historian um, and can also be useful to the historian of ancient slavery is archaeology. Um, the problem is it's often very difficult to identify objects that, or, or um, sites that can be associated with slavery. Um, a rare and explicit example is the Laurion silver mines in uh, just outside classical Athens, which I mentioned earlier. Um, you see in this photo a stark example of shackles that were found there, which kind of bring to life the, the grim reality of ancient slavery. But often it's not that straightforward. Um, we also have artistic um, depictions of ancient slavery, um, which can, in their own right, be extremely useful. I've put here a, an, a Roman example and an ancient Greek example. So we have um, individuals being dragged off into slavery in this stone relief on the left. And then on the right, um, we have what are believed to be slaves um, working uh, on an olive farm. In addition to archaeology and art, we also have sources which combine the element of object and text. Um, so we have papyri um, and also 
Um, epigraphy, inscriptions, usually written on stone, um, although there is huge variety within this. Um, ancient inscriptions um, are, are sometimes long decorated official texts uh, detailing important political decisions and then sometimes it's graffiti scribbled on a wall or names etched into a fragment of pottery. Um, but I'm going to show you here two inscriptions and I want you to think about what they mean for ancient slavery. So the key questions I want you to think about when you look at these texts are first of all whose perspective do these sources represent? Second of all what might they tell us about the experience of slaves? Thirdly, what they might tell us about the Athenian attitude towards slaves, that is the attitude of slave owners towards slavery. And then finally, is either of these sources more useful than the other? My, so the first text that I want you to look at is a lead letter found in Athens, um, in which an individual, Lysis, writes to his mother asking for help after he's being beaten uh, working in this foundry. Um, so the text reads, Lysis sends this letter to Xenocles and to his mother, begging them not to ignore that he is perishing in the blacksmiths, but to come to his masters and find something better for him. For I have been handed over to a man thoroughly wicked. I am perishing from being whipped. I am tied up. I am treated like dirt more and more. So you might want to pause the video here and just have a little think about these questions. Whose perspective is this written from? What does it tell us about the experience of slavery? And what does it tell us about Athenian attitudes towards slavery? My the second inscription I'd like to show you is also from Classical Athens, um, but it's from a very different context. Um, you'll see that it's quite boring, it's quite repetitive. Um, this is an official document which records the penalties for stealing from a sacred temple to the god Apollo. Um, so this text reads, Gods, on behalf of himself, the public good and the people of Athens, the priest of Apollo proposed a decree and forbade anyone from cutting down the sacred tree of Apollo, or from carrying away its wood or twigs, its sticks or leaves. If someone is caught cutting off or carrying one of these pro prohibited parts of the tree, um, and if they are a slave, they shall receive 50 lashes of the whip and let the priest hand them over, along with the name of their master, to the chief magistrate and the council, according to the decree of the council and the people of Athens. But if the thief is a free man, the priest will find him 50 drachmas, uh, a drachma is uh, a coin, um, and hand his name over to the chief magistrate and to the council, according to the decree and the council of the people of Athens. So I'm going to pause the video again here and just have a read over this key bit of text um, and think again about these questions. So the questions about perspective, about what it tells us about the experience of slavery and the Athenian attitude towards slavery. And then think about it in relation to the previous inscription. Um, so which source is more or less valuable and um, in what ways are they interesting but different? My, my perspective, uh, both of these inscriptions provide interesting points for comparison. Um, so while text one is from the perspective, uh, the very rare perspective of an enslaved person, text two is very much the perspective of the establishment. Um, text one is this private letter and it has this um, emotional um, undertone and it really gives us the, a sense of the experience of, of Lysis um, as a slave. Whereas text two is this public document, it's very functional and formulaic, um, and it's quite cold and hard um, when it comes to slavery. Um, what both texts do is reveal the kind of normalisation of punishment and of whipping in particular of slaves in classical Athens. Um, what's particularly interesting, I think, in text two is that it juxtaposes, uh, sits next to each other, um, the punishment for the same crime committed by a slave and a free person. Um, if it's committed by a slave, they are to receive 50 lashes of the whip. Um, if it's a free person, they are to pay a fine of 50 drachmas. Um, and I think this says something about the mentality of the Athenians and of the way they separated um, slaves and free. 
Um, I also think it's interesting in the second text um, that the name of the slave owner um, is to be passed on to the um, to the council. And so in a sense, the slave owner is deemed responsible for their slaves' actions. And all of this, I think, adds up to a kind of uh, a dehumanizing of the slave in classical Athens. Um, now, of course, the, the question of which of these uh, sources is more useful uh, was a bit of a mean one. Uh, they're both extremely valuable, um, but I hope it's clear they're valuable in slightly different ways. Um, and I hope it's clear that these sometimes mundane texts, these inscriptions, can be as useful to us um, as the more traditional sources of ancient history. So thank you very much for listening. Um, what I would like you to take away from this, I hope, is that um, slavery played a really important role in the functioning of the ancient world. Um, the existence and the exploitation of enslaved persons in a, a huge variety of contexts in almost every part of the ancient world uh, must be taken into account when we're reconstructing our image of the ancient world. We can't just leave this out or ignore it or focus on the bits that we, we like or that we admire. Um, but I also hope to have demonstrated that we have to work quite hard to identify slavery in the ancient world. Um, and we must use quite a wide range of sources uh, and not just the literature which um, historians more generally are accustomed to using. Um, yes, so thank you for listening.